Um, I'll give you a little uh, uh, framework of what we just discussed this morning. But we can clearly talk about all activities that the U.S. Army are taking in support of uh, the Commander Chief's guidance for the, the fight against the COVID-19. Uh, so uh, this morning, uh, the General Conville of SMA and I sat down with MRDC leadership and went through the, the three lines of operation of prevention, detection, and treatment uh, that the Medical Research and Development Command is uh, organized against this extraordinary challenge. And uh, so uh, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the uh, infusion of funding that's come from the second and then the supplemental that was just uh, passed the other night, but also the uh, request for just shy of $900 million uh, to finance those activities across those three lines of effort how the team has postured itself uh, to expand its uh, capacity to, uh, to attack uh, those lines of effort. With, uh, there's about five tracks of vaccine efforts with uh, a couple dozen candidates that are being worked between the private sector and the government. And uh, they talked us through how they're looking at these various candidates and ultimately will select the best horse to back and get through the process. Uh, on the, uh, as well as on the prevention side, we looked at the diagnostic kit capacity and how they're working with industry to increase capacity of testing from both a mobile site to as well as some much more larger scale national-like capabilities. And as well as on the treatment front, uh, they actually walked us through uh, how the soldier in uh, Korea, who was one of the first soldiers infected uh, by this terrible virus and how he is, uh, as treatment has been going. Uh, very fortunately uh, for us, an officer who was stationed here uh, is one of his attending physicians forward, so uh, they have great relationships uh, and passing of the information. I'll tell you, it's extraordinary uh, the pressure that is under that soldier's family, and he's donating his blood, and he is doing everything he can to be supportive in this process. So, God bless him and his family as he gets through this fight. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we got to spend a few hours with some extraordinary Americans who were at the forefront of this fight. And uh, we're getting them all the resources that they can, trying to get them as much time and energy as they can so they knock down any roadblocks that are in their path of moving samples, getting through bureaucratic hurdles. Uh, so putting the entire weight of the Army behind this effort. Uh, I'd like the chief to make a couple comments, and then uh, maybe we can open up for questions. The, the, the heroes in this fight are going to be some of the, the, the people we saw today, uh, the scientists that are working uh, to find uh, the vaccinations, the scientists that are, are, are working uh, to find the drugs for treatment, the scientists that are aggressively increasing the capacity of the testing capability and then all those medical professionals, those doctors, those nurses uh, that are throughout the country that are really going to defeat uh, this virus. But we are here to assist them, and we are very proud of what they are doing. I'd like to ask you if you see that extending other protocols, that decision. And if so, at what point does the suspension of troop movements affect readiness? And do you potentially see a shortage of resources in Columbus as you have troops are able to come back? Yeah, I, I think what we're seeing is, is commanders are doing risk assessments in each of their theaters. Uh, they're making sure uh, that they, they have the appropriate uh, force available to conduct the mission. That's what General Miller is doing. He's assessing the situation uh, over the next 30 days, and he'll basically do uh, an assessment of risk to the mission, which he's trying to accomplish, and risk to the force. And we'll work that very closely with him. Well, I think I think what you're going to see is, you know, over over the next 30 to 60 days, um, we're watching this very very closely, and then providing the resources for screening and testing, so we get an assessment of what the risk to the force is, and then from that we can determine what the risk of the mission is. And so um, we don't know yet exactly how that's going to play out, but we do have uh, the procedures and measures in place. Uh, to conduct the missions and at the same time protect the force. On 
<laughs> well, over the last, uh, I guess it was eight or nine months, there was uh, work that had been going on back and forth between uh, the, uh, the MRDC and the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense. The, the business model for uh, this this organization is a reimbursable model, and you so eight, eight other government agencies would then come here and apply, for, you know, put work orders in, and they would conduct the research. Uh, you're, what you're reflecting is the funding associated with that. And there was some back and forth just about the operating model uh, of how things would work. And it, it before the general tally, any other specifics I may miss. But uh, that was, that was a, a part and parcel of just how it operates. The MRDC has been moving towards a rate board so that they could uh, much more clearly articulate the costs and how the work gets done. Uh, and that uh, going forward will operate under that different model. With respect to resources, though, uh, over the last, four, uh, like, let's say, 30 days, General Tally, correct me if I'm wrong, we've been moving uh, millions and millions of dollars. There's a $900 million request that's in the third supplemental. So there's an infusion of financial resources that are coming to MRDC. General Tally, anything more? Absolutely. Um, and with respect to the COVID efforts, uh, we have to think of that completely separate and different from our funding streams. And the Secretary of the Army, uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, very, uh, very, very good at just uh, securing the dollars that are going to come in for that specific research. And with respect to uh, RID, uh, U.S. Army uh, Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, uh, if you think of a two-fold mission, which uh, one is for research, the basic research, uh, that goes after uh, the diseases, the non-battle injuries, if you will, that affect our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. And then there's a response mission, uh, like uh, what we're facing right now with COVID. If you go back to uh, the Ebola crisis, even Zika, this laboratory has uh, played an important role in the discoveries towards uh, prevention, treatment, and detection. So completely uh, different funding stream. We're working well uh, right now with OSD uh, for that uh, temporary funding uh, withhold, again, getting the financial apparatus uh, to where we can manage effectively. But uh, with respect to COVID-19, uh, no disruptions whatsoever. And we're expecting, in fact, we've actually received uh, additional funding for that effort. Thanks for the question. Are there additional resources that can be put towards this fight? Um, is, is, the, is the Army do, can we be doing more? Uh, uh, there's so it looks at a variety of different capabilities that can be brought forward, whether it's uh, medical support, but it's also uh, the research, like we're, we're talking about here. We're, we're learning every day uh, around the country, and we're learning from uh, in Korea and Italy. And one thing I know was remiss to say in my opening remarks is just the extraordinary performance of General Abrams in Korea and to Major General Roger Coulier in Italy of how they've been able to protect the force forward in some very uh, tough environments. Uh, and um, we've learned a lot from the uh, te tactics, techniques, and procedures, just how they prevented the, the outbreak um, and be able to protect the force in this difficult climate. Uh, what you, what I, I don't know if you're re referring to doing more for uh, around the country. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, combat support hospitals on prepared and deploy orders. The U.S. Navy is deploying their uh, their ships, the Comfort and the Mercy, which are hospital ships. Uh, we have additional capabilities that we're looking at, but a lot of it comes down to working with the state levels and knowing what their needs are, and then ultimately, the Commander in Chief can make a decision and push those capabilities forward. Um, how is it going to impact your recruiting uh, capabilities? Uh, you know, you know, goals for this year. Um, what adjustments are you making, uh, or will you be making? when it comes to the throughput of recruits into their units uh, or even into basic training itself? You know, I would say initially that well, I think the chief should come in as well, but, but uh, we, we were in very good shape with this recruiting cycle, actually ahead of goal, substantially ahead, so we have some margin at this point, but we're learning every day. Is this a flu virus that is seasonal? Will it boomerang back in, the, in this next cycle? Every day we know more, so when you, when you hear uh, the leaders like Dr. Fauci and Dr. Redfield talking about testing, and we're getting more data every day. We're getting smarter on this problem every day. The, the measures that we've taken, it's a lot of it is risk-based. There are areas of the country that are being affected more than others, Washington State, New York. 
And if you look at young men and women that feel like they need to stay home and be with their families, we're looking at options like delayed bonuses and others so that we can keep them in the queue, try to weather through this very difficult period, and then ship later. So uh, I think Major General Frank Booth at Army Recruiting Command is doing a remarkable job. And he's 45 here, 50 there. He's got his finger on the pulse of this effort. Uh, we're looking at measures of how do you move troops through the MEPS process and ultimately to a recruiting location but we got to be as safe as we can. We have got to be able to protect the force. The world is complex and dangerous on any given day. Now you add these additional conditions. Uh, we're literally managing this on a case-by-case -case basis in the department, and we're making very appropriate risk-based decisions. decisions. Chief? Yeah, uh, parents are send, sending us as sons and daughters, and we have an obligation uh, to take care of them. Um, many of, of these young men and women are, were expecting to go to work, so you know, they may have quit their jobs to, to go ahead and serve, so we're very cognizant of that. As the Secretary said, if, if for some reason the situation does not allow them to ship, then we're looking at ways we can possibly compensate them to, you know, so they're not unemployed and they, and, and they may be committed to us. But the second thing is we're putting in place is measures all along the way to protect these young men and women. So when they go to the recruiter, you know, before they leave the recruiter, they'll be screened. When they go to the military entrance processing station, which we like to call MEPS, and I had to kind of remember what that meant because I thought you might ask me, but, but that's where they go. We're doing the same type of screening there. And then when they go to one of our four training sites, whether it's Fort Jackson, Fort, Fort Benning, Fort Leningrad, or, or, or Fort Sill, is we want to, you know, again, bring them in test them and then have the capability if someone um, shows some of the symptoms we have the ability there to go ahead and quarantine them and make sure they have the necessary medical capability so their safety is secured all the way through the process and, and what we're really trying to do with our, with our bases in, in a lot of ways is what, what uh, General Abrams found is the closer you can make it to a bubble a safety bubble where everyone is screened and we're not in a position uh, to be affected by uh, the coronavirus, the better off it would be. But we, we are piloting that this week. We've kind of reduced the amount of recruits that we would normally send them to see how that plays out. We're going to adapt the process and come back with some recommendations. So you're not recommending it. <coughs> so you're at this time, you're not recommending um, uh, ac accepting recruits into the basic, for basic training? No, we are. We are. We are. We're shipping right now. We are. No, no, you're not going to stop. Right now, we, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're putting procedures to allow us to continue to ship, and that's going to base, be based on the rest of uh, soldiers will continue to ship to basic training. But literally getting down case by case. Uh, you, you were on this VTC with us yesterday. You would have seen Major General Frank Muth was drilling down into zip codes of just where these young men and women are coming from, making risk-based decisions, communicating with them, based off of challenges they may face in their neighborhoods, and we're gonna manage that accordingly and look at to see if you can put in a, a delay bonus or something of that nature to keep, them, to keep them in the queue, but should try to weather through this very, very difficult period. Nancy, do you have a moment? Um, there's two combat support hospitals that are in a prepared to deploy orders. So that's a very short string, bags packed, getting ready to go. Now, uh, each one of those hospitals, correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, is 264 beds in each of those two hospitals. And then they have ICU capability. Wait, well, 284. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll get you the math. We'll get you but, uh, the but that's that's two of these hospitals, two field hospitals. We have more capabilities. But you know, obviously, we have 191,000 troops deployed right now. So we uh, we work we have um, we have the baseline of capabilities, and we're working with the Office of the Secretary of Defense on the capabilities being forward. But one thing that we really we really need to think about is this: the, the National Guard is on the front edge of this. You know, Guard units supporting in their states. Uh, you know, what, what I think they're referring to the quote you're referring to was General Friedrichs from the uh, Joint Staff. Yes. He was talking about some active duty capabilities that we could bring very quickly 
to the most affected states at this point, at Washington State and New York in particular, that they're, they're on the short string to support that initially. Now, but yeah, I think it's very important to truly, in your reporting, to look and see just how much the National Guard is doing at this juncture. Chief, anything you want to add? Yeah, I do, I, I do want to talk about the, the National Guard. One of the decisions that you heard we made, the, the 81st Striker Brigade Combat Team will not deploy to the Combat Training Center. And, and that's a fairly significant event because those soldiers are coming from Washington and California. So one of the ways we support the community, quite frankly, is, is saying, Hey, we're not going to take those those guardsmen and put them in a training environment because we're anticipating that they you know when we talk to the states they need to be used locally to help with logistics to help with medical and so those are some of the type of things we're doing and many of you know when you look at our the secretary talked about you know, we have different types of hospitals we have what we call a combat support hospital that has 248 beds we're in the process of kind of, of transitioning to field hospitals that have 32 beds, but they can be augmented. So we have different capabilities that we're putting on, that we're on the active uh, force. We're saying, okay, who's ready to go? Who's not ready to go? Get ready to go. But the other thing is we're doing risk mitiga mitigation because these doctors, these lawyers, these doctors, these nurses, these medical professionals, they also work in our medical treatment facilities. And on our reserve side, many of these medical professionals, they're actually working in the so if we take them and call them up in the reserves, we may be taking them out of the very communities that we're trying to help. So that's what we're, we're going down to the person. Is this person you know, engaged in providing medical support in an area that they really need them? If we call them up, are we going to hurt the community? And we're getting down to that level on, on who, we, who we pick. And as well as what the chief mentioned, is changing the configuration of these hospitals from just pure trauma to working infectious diseases. Uh, they're in the process of that and, and uh, be ready shortly. And, and, that, and that's a point which I really want to reinforce the Secretary made. You know, these hospitals are really designed for combat type operations, trauma, gunshot wounds, blasts, and those type things. They're not really designed for infectious diseases. But what the military can do is maybe take the load off and you know, allow you know, the civilian hospitals to, to focus on, on these issues. The, the other thing we're doing is our Corps of Engineers um, is working very closely with at least four governors we know right now. Uh, our head of the engineers, uh, Todd, Jim, Todd Sumnight, met with uh, the New York governor. And you know, people talk about, can, can we build hospitals? Well, we think the fastest way is to take a look at uh, hotels and, and dormitories, dormitories that are available, and then um, Rescope them, you know, maybe put in the power they need to do that very, very quickly. Uh, some even talking about putting under pressure into the capability so, you know, the, if there's any type of disease, it stays in, it doesn't go out, but we can quickly build capacity uh, in this way. We did this during World War II. The Greenbrier, which sits out, if anyone's ever been to Greenbrier, was an Army hospital during World War II, so this is not something that. Do you see the idea of using hospitals and dormitories? Is that imminent? Is that something we can expect? Well, what we're doing is we're working with the governors. Uh, with, you know, one of the things that we is giving them options. We, you know, we can build. We have the capability. We say build army engineers. What they're doing is contract. They have the capability to bring in the expertise. They're not actually. You know, we're not putting army engineers to build that. But what we're doing is offering those governors options. You know, we can build, but it may take you this long to build. We can re um, kind of scope uh, these dormitories and hotels or we can come up with some other options. And you know, in a lot of these situations, like large open tents aren't really the best place to put people with infectious diseases altogether. So we're working through some options and, and, and giving them uh, some options that they can work with. Is there an update on whether Houston is going to be soon at full operation? It's, we've had to gradually come back after the shutdown. The CDC has revisited Yosemite uh, two times, each time allowing uh, more of the laboratory science uh, to be allowed uh, under the, regula the strict le regulatory requirements of the CDC. Uh, it's come back uh, much faster than anticipated. Um, COVID-19 is not uh, considered a bioselect agent, so it's not under the same restrictions. Uh, in fact, when, we, when it was known that USAM would be involved, uh, first phone call went to the CDC 
And they assured me, no, we absolutely need your sovereign's help on this, like they had with other responses. Um, this is not a, uh, a, it doesn't fall under the same category. The same restrictions do not apply. But with respect to the other types of work, um, they were released or actually uh, allowed to conduct um, a second wave, if you will, of experimentation, which brings us up uh, to uh, about the BSL-3 uh, type of capability. And uh, that's, that's continuing to be a, a gradual process back to full operation capability, if you will. Uh, but again, with the COVID-19 efforts, we're allowed to go uh, full speed, if you will, with full operational capabilities. Uh, overseas, we've heard case about what's going on at Fort Bliss and some other bases when they're being quarantined. Um, obviously, we have these uh, social distancing measures in place, um, but it doesn't sound like they were being implemented fully when they're returning. So if, if you talk to yeah. uh, You know, first of all, we have you know, the greatest soldiers in the world, and they're very disciplined. Um, but we, we absolutely have to learn, just like the rest of the society has to learn that we're going to have to change our, our habits. And what we've done in the past doesn't work uh, for what we're going to do for this particular case. So I think the expectations were a little different from when they redeployed in the past and what they're, they're doing now. They're doing great. Uh, the senior mission commander is going to address the issues that we had. But this is, this is something we all have to learn how to live with. This is how we have to learn. We gotta be socially distant from each other. We're, we're just not used to that. We're not comfortable with that. And every 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 time we get this, we're gonna learn. And that's what's great about our army. We we talk. We're constantly communicating globally in an instant. We have the resources that we can talk all the way across the globe and said, Hey, this is what I learned. That didn't go so well. We get, we're gonna improve on that, and we're, we're gonna improve every day. Our soldiers are disciplined. The leaders are great. Uh, we have ways to learn on this, on how we bring people back and how we interact with each other. We're going to get better every day. And the soldiers are going to understand we're going to protect the force. Now, we got to protect not only you know the soldiers, we got to protect the American people. Um, so we're going to learn from this, and I think we're doing right.